What's up, Hyperfast Nation? On this episode of the show, I have a guest who's been on the show twice before. It's been about a year and a half since his last time on the show. He has expanded his DC flipping business, now has over a dozen single family projects, plus a couple of multifamily projects that he's working on. Welcome to the show, Chris Clark. Welcome back to the show, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm good, Dan. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Yeah, actually, I, I knew you were on before, but then I was looking up the notes before. This is actually your third time. You were on episode 135 right at the start of the pandemic, and then, and then episode 156, uh, about first uh, kind of summer of the pandemic. Uh, right. ho- hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, we don't have another summer of that uh, coming our way. Give, give the listeners and viewers out there a little bit of an update on What's transpired in your business the last year and a half? Yeah, so I guess the last time I came on, like you said, was summer of 2020. Um, you know, continued to make some good progress since then, grown the company a little bit since then. I brought on uh, an acquisition manager who helps, uh, you know, source my deals, analyze my deals and make offers, uh, which has taken a lot off my plate and, uh, you know, kind of helped me to focus on ongoing projects, uh, raising private capital and just setting up the business to be more successful. Um, you know, still primarily focusing on DC single family homes, uh, primarily DC row homes, uh, just buying distressed, distressed properties, renovating and reselling them. Nothing super crazy there, but I have done uh, three condo conversion projects in the past year as well. Uh, which obviously you're familiar with, which, you know, they're larger projects, uh, a little bit more risk, but the payout can be uh, much higher at the end. What's the difference between doing one house versus turning a row home into four condos? Like what's, what's the difference in the effort, the capital required and the profits? Yeah. So the biggest difference I would say is the time, right? So, uh, and primarily, I mean, I would say primarily permitting and then obviously the construction takes longer as well, just depending on the scope of the project. So for single family home in D.C., um, you know, assuming you're working with an architect who knows what they're doing, you can probably get your permit in 21 to 45 days uh, on average. doesn't take too long, whereas if you're doing a condo conversion project, especially one where you're, uh, you know, adding square footage. Uh, doing an addition or if it's brand new construction, that permitting process can take uh, much, much longer, you know, on the short end, three months, if you're flying through it on the long end, you know, nine, possibly 12 months, if, you know, it gets caught up in, in one of the review cycles. Um, so definitely, you know, permitting time and then obviously the construction time as well, right? So if, again, if you're doing a larger construction project, it's going gonna, it's gonna to add more time than if you're just doing a, an interior renovation of an existing row home. So I would say, you know, the biggest thing is time. You're going to want to make sure you factor that into your underwriting. And then, of course, um, you know, just larger numbers, you know, the purchase price, larger construction costs, bigger. So you need to, you know, make sure you're comfortable, um, you know, playing around with, with those type of figures. And, you know, I would definitely highly recommend having completed several single family projects before you decide to move into the, the condo conversion, because it is similar, but, um, you know, very different as well. There's a lot of intricacies to it uh, that you need to be aware of and factor in. Especially with what's going on right now with supply chains being disrupted, work shortages. I've, I've kind of put this question out actually on TikTok and Instagram you know, this Mm -hmm. concept of doing small flips versus big flips, which at the end of the day, these are all flips. There's just 
how big of a flip, right? Right. There's like the cosmetic uh, ones, the the building one new single family, and then and then doing condos. Um, right. And and I I think I, I like that you said you know you should do single families first um, mm-hmm. before you get into these bigger projects, and I, and I think that's true for most people. And I I put this question out on TikTok and Instagram of like which which would you rather do or, or, or start with and i know big flips are big profits but they take right. longer more capital more exposure to markets changing so i think i think for a lot of operators if, if you can get good at smaller flips and turn them over more especially in this market right. it might it might be a better place to start um which which do you prefer you know having having done a few of each now um that's a good question i mean I guess I'll, I'll circle back for a sec. So I, 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 like I said, I recommend probably doing a few single family first, but by no means is that, you know, a hundred percent, you know, like a law. Like I, I actually know several uh, or a couple of investors uh, who have, you know, they dove right into a 10 unit condo conversion project and, you know, they learned a lot throughout the project, but they still did quite well at the end. So uh, I guess if you have a high risk tolerance, uh, and you're willing to learn and, you know, you have a, a big profit margin to play around with, you know, it's not the, you certainly can dive right into a condo conversion project. So I uh, just wanted to clarify that real quick, but um, right now I like having a blend of both. Um, the small deals are nice because they're relatively straightforward. They're not going to cause a ton of headaches. They still have their headaches, but they're usually smaller and easier to deal with. Uh, and you turn your money around and make, uh, you know, your profit in six months or so. Whereas the larger projects, uh, like I said, they take longer, bigger headaches usually, um, but you get a, you know, at the end, you get a much larger profit. So right now I like having a mix of both. I have, um, you know, spread out between active, uh, active development projects, completed projects, project listed for sale. I have, uh, 16 different projects now 13 of them are single family three are condo conversions so if i was doing all condo conversions you know um i could be waiting six nine twelve months to get my profit which could make cash flow tight where but since i have the single family mixed in as well you know i'm you know usually finishing and selling one or two every every month or every other month which helps with the cash flow um, keep things moving and then, you know, maybe once or twice a year, sell off a condo conversion project, which provides the larger uh, payoff. So I guess to answer your question, um, a mix of both favoring the single family, you know, probably 75% of my business, but I have liked adding, you know, a few condo conversion projects into the mix here recently. How are you managing 13 of the, you know, of these single families plus the, plus the condos? <laughs> Like I, yeah. I know you have the acquisition, a team member now helping on finding the deals mm-hmm. and betting them, but how do you, how do you manage managing all these projects? Yeah, it can be a lot at times for sure. Um, I would say the biggest thing is working with great general contractors. Uh, so I primarily work with three different contractors um, and they all have like project managers and are well-established and, um, allow me to be relatively hands off. Now, obviously, I'm still going to DC a few times a week to check in on, you know, the status of the projects. Um, you know, just doing my due diligence and making sure things are moving along. Uh, you know, quality control type stuff. So, um, you know, I'm definitely busy. There's uh, there's some days where my head is spinning, but I certainly wouldn't be able to do it if I was using a contractor who didn't know what they're doing. So. Um, you know, using a great contractor uh, takes a lot off my plate and, um, you know, makes my job a lot easier. Do they know when you're coming by or do you like to kind of surprise them? Um, unless, unless we've like scheduled a meeting to talk about a certain thing, I'll just show up at any given time, which is always good to see what's going on when you're not there and they're not expecting you. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, even if you have great contractors, you need to, you need to get there a certain amount of times to, to right. verify that 
what they say is happening is actually happening. Right. Yeah. I mean, even the best contractors are still going to make mistakes or something's going to take longer than it should. And so you just have to be there to, you know, check in on them and manage them um, to keep things moving. What's been the biggest challenge for you, you know, during the last two years or, or, or so of, of the pandemic and, you know, acquiring, building, selling all of these projects? Yeah, so um, for the past year or so, I mean, the answer is not going to surprise you. I would say supply chain issues has been um, a big one for sure, as well as labor shortages. Um, I really don't go more than a day without one of my contractors calling me to tell me that uh, some material is, you know, delayed, uh, you know, windows that were supposed to come in in November 1st, got pushed to December 1st to January 15th. And now we're looking at, you know, hopefully we get them later this month. Um, so the supply chain is still kind of a mess. It seems like the, the lumber, which was the hot topic, you know, six months ago, it seems like that has gotten more normalized, but now, uh, you know, Windows is the thing that's delayed a few of my projects. Um, so, of course, you have the supply chain and then the labor shortages. Like, uh, I think so many people are building that it's tough to get your contractor and their subs, uh, you know, to prioritize your 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 project sometimes. Um, so that's been a challenge as well. Uh, as you know, the D.C. market was so hot has been so hot for you know the past 18 months that once you finish a project, selling it really hasn't been an issue as long as you have a good product to sell. Um, so yeah, I would say supply chain and labor shortages. It's, sure. it's funny you mentioned lumber getting better because it, because it did for a while, but there's been some headlines in the last, I'd say like 30 to 45 days or so that the supply is oh, yeah. tightening, tightening up again, which is it getting bad again? You know, I don't, I don't want to get the tinfoil hat on, but it just seems ironic heading into the spring market that this is, is happening again. But that's that's what some of the headlines are saying that prices are starting to head back up. So that that might be something to to kind of watch, you know. And, yeah, uh, I, and I'm sure Omicron is this wave of that is not helping because the shortage isn't trees like the tree farmers, you know, the guys who own timber, they're still getting close to, I believe, like the same prices they were decades ago. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's it's all in like the harvesting and processing at the mills, which a lot of that capacity has not kept up. Interesting. Yeah, I haven't had a contractor complain to me about lumber in a few weeks, so I guess. I was uh, assuming it was getting better, but uh, I, had, I guess I had missed those headlines. Yeah, it's it's interesting to, you know, just talking to other builders and developers. Some of, some of them are actually so fed up with the work shortages, the supply chain issues that they're doing less starts, even though they're, they're still really profitable because mm -hmm. while your, your input costs have gone up so so have the output and right. what, what we've kind of noticed is for every dollar increase we get in cost we're getting a dollar 20 increase in the in the sale so sale, yeah it's it's keeping the margins constant or, or expanding a little bit yeah, but mm -hmm. um but a, but a lot of a lot of people on the building side developing side are just fed up with the delays and they're doing less which ironically will make the housing shortage worse you would think right in, in the next year or so yeah no it's definitely frustrating at times to you know that your project is delayed by you know material shortages unfortunately there's not a ton we can do about it right so you kind of just have to uh, understand that going into it you know factor it into your your hold time and you know, try to try to keep making as much progress as you can. Yeah. How, how do you plan time and budget wise for that? Like what, what kind of time and money uh, contingencies are you putting mm -hmm. into your initial estimates right now? Yeah. So for, for a single family home uh, in my underwriting, I will use uh, 30 days for the permitting process. 
um, then I'll factor in six months for construction, which, um, you know, really it should be closer to four or five if things are moving along nicely, uh, which we just spent five minutes talking about how things aren't really moving along nicely. So I've been factoring in an extra one to two months there. Um, and then once the project's completed, I factor in, you know, another 21 days uh, for it to, to be on the market and 30 days to sell. Uh, the 21 days, you know, sometimes, as you know, it sells in the first weekend. Um, sometimes, you know, for a variety of reasons, it takes longer. Um, but those are those are the inputs I've been using. So from purchase to close, you know, with with those inputs, it's usually about an eight to nine month hold time is what I estimate for single family for condo conversion projects. Totally different animal. Um, you know, like we talked about earlier, it could be six months for uh the permitting you know depending on the scope of the construction a year for construction and then however many units you have to sell you know that would obviously just depend on on how long you're going to be on the market for and the closing timelines so you're adding more more time into that when, and when you factor in holding costs and whatnot what about the the cost side are you are you building a bigger buffer than you normally would yeah, so when I make my offers, um, I will usually have a, a feasibility period in there so that I can, you know, get my contractors out there and, and get pretty concrete bids. Um, so I'm, I'm usually not buying a house unless, uh, or I'm usually not buying a property unless I have a firm bid from one of my contractors. Uh, that being said, in the underwriting portion, for my own estimates, you know, I used to estimate on the low end, $100 a square foot for uh, you know a, a single family row home in DC that's going to sell for around $800,000, you know, which isn't expensive in our market. Um, that was on the low end. Now, you know, some of the more expensive projects that I'm trying to sell for, you know, a million and a half, maybe push two million. The construction costs I'm estimating are you know $200 a foot plus. Um, so the mm -hmm. construction has gotten crazy. You know, I know my first two projects or my first few projects when I started back in uh, 2017, I think I did a couple DC row homes for under 200 grand, um, which looking back is crazy because I think the most recent one that I've, you know, that I'm closing on tomorrow, actually, you know, the construction cost is 550 plus. Uh, now, granted, it's, it's going to be a very nice home. That's um, insane. But yeah. The, so, yeah, I guess. It's more than to doubled. circle back on your question, construction costs have increased significantly as well. Wow. How are you, uh, what, I, guess, I guess the other question I had on this line is with the supply chain being mm -hmm. longer, sometimes you got to put deposits in sooner and, and, and bigger you know, amounts to get anything from lumber, windows, appliances. How does that factor in how do you plan for that do the banks work with you on giving you draws earlier or do you have to have more equity or cash on hand to to mitigate that yeah so um i haven't had any banks give me pre-draws unfortunately uh even if i have a paid invoice in my hand uh, they say the material needs to be mm. on site or usually not even on site it needs to be constructed it needs to be completed um, so no real assistance from the banks there or the hard money lenders. Um, so yeah, just, you know, coming out of pocket with cash or, uh, you know, raising more private equity to, to help with, um, you know, cash flow. But yeah, again, I guess circling back to an earlier question, that's why I like having the single family deals mixed in as well so that, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly getting cash back into my business. And if, as you know, the, the larger projects can be very cash intensive, uh, which helps with some of those expenses. Yeah, I think to, just to summarize, you know, whether you're doing single family or condo, townhouse, you know, multi bigger, bigger projects, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like you got to plan for more costs, plan for more time and, yeah. and have more equity or cash on hand than you might have needed two years ago. Right. Uh, wh where, where do you go next from here? So, you know, you've built up to, you know, 15, 16 projects at a time. Is that a level you're going to maintain or are you looking to 
pull back at all or looking to increase it? Yeah, I've, uh, it's a question I've kind of debated with myself over the past year or so. I think flipping houses primarily, in particular single family, can be a hard business to scale or to really scale because each project can be very different and each project can really have their own unique challenges. Um, and unless you have a you know five-star team in place, it's always going to come back to you and you're going to be the one dealing with the issues, which if, if you've scaled it to, you know, let's say 50 projects at once, you just can't realistically manage that. Um, so I, I think for me personally, 15 to 20 projects uh, and that they're not all in, you know, active development, you know, so I have like five, five of those that are completed and under contract to sell. So I'm pretty much at this point, hands off, just working with title companies. So those are very little of my time. Uh, but the ones that are actively under construction, those are the ones that really take your time. Um, so I think for me, you know, probably I'd like to add another few team members, uh, you know, a project manager so that I'm not the one personally going, uh, you know, to the projects every week, um, you know, maybe another one acquisition specialist and, and someone who can help with uh you know, the administrative task once it's listed for sale and, you know, under contract to sell. So I'd like to continue to grow my team uh, so that I can focus primarily just on the business and, and um, you know, making sure the business runs successfully. But I think, you know, 15, 20 projects is a good level for me. Um, you know, maybe go to a level where it's 50-50, uh, 50% 50, 50 single family, 50%, you know, condo projects. So I continue to have a good mix, but uh, you know, add on some some larger projects, some more larger projects as well. Are you doing anything to diversify, like like build up real estate portfolios in other markets or or other types? You know, ones you hold or or any other investments or you know things of you know like like that to, to right. take some eggs out of one basket and into some other. Uh, I do have a, a couple of rental properties in DC. I'm looking to to get a few more outside of the DC market. Like I would love to, you know, own an apartment building um, in some sub market where it's much cheaper and you can get nice cash flow. That's always been a goal of mine. Um, haven't, haven't purchased any yet, but that's something I have my eye on for sure. Um, but no, I'm pretty, a pretty heavy real estate base now. <laughs> All right. Well, um... It's been great having you on the show for the third time. And, and I always like to end, you know, with the hyper fast round. So if you're ready, we can do some right. questions and answers here. Let's do it. All right. What's the biggest challenge you think new investors face in the market right now? I think the biggest challenge new investors have always faced is capital. Um, they think that they need to have all of their own money to do a deal, um, which you definitely do not need to always use your own money. You can raise private money um, to help, you know, buy a deal and help with the carrying costs, help with the construction costs. Problem is, if you haven't done your first deal yet, it can be kind of hard to raise that money. So you really need to, you know, find someone who's willing to partner with you or willing to be a capital partner uh, until you get your footing and can go out and raise money on your own, you know, previous success. So I think, um, you know, the capital to get into real estate is a barrier that a lot of people look at and, you know, they just immediately turn away because they think it's not possible for them. When it is possible, you just have to get a little creative sometimes. What's a mistake you see experienced real estate investors making? Ooh. Um, that's a good one. Biggest mistake? I don't know. I mean, usually the experienced investors are the ones that don't make the the big mistakes. Um, I'm not sure. You have an answer for that one? I, I yeah, I would I would say it would, it would be expanding too quickly, okay. right? Or or not, you know. So someone who's at your level, like if you went to thirty, right, but didn't hire more more managers, uh, right? I think, yeah. I think that's a common one that, that experienced people do. 
yeah, expanding too quickly can be can be scary. When I first started, I was doing, you know, two or three at a time and tried to make the jump from two or three at a time to, you know, straight into 15 to 20. And I kind of made a mess of things. Um, you know, this is a couple of years ago now, but yeah, definitely, uh, you know, growing gradually and, um, you know, proving that you can do one model before growing on it, I think is definitely good advice. What, what kind of pain or, or uh, profit loss did you suffer during that time when you said you made a mess of things or, or you know, were the project still profitable, but just not as much or, or walk us through that uh, real quick? There were two of them that I lost money on. Uh, it wasn't anything that, you know, was going to take me out, but it was uh, tickling the six figure range, which is painful, but Luckily, I had enough other projects that were profitable where I was able to, you know, take those losses, learn some nice lessons, some painful lessons, but learn some lessons and uh, and move on. So you ended up doing five projects uh, and, and maybe getting the profit of what one would bring you, but you learned <laughs> some valuable lessons. <laughs> right, exactly. If you could start all over and uh you couldn't take your money you couldn't take your reputation you couldn't take uh anything with you except the lessons you learned what would the first thing uh be that you, that you do i would say find great partners um whether you want to partner with them you know 50 50 on a deal or whether like we talked about um finding great contractors People, I think a misconception is that, you know, we do this all on our own when in reality, we deal with so many people, we touch so many different partners on any given transaction that really having, you know, solid concrete, uh, you know, partners on each deal is so important and can, you can be as good as you want, but if you have a bad contractor, um, bad title companies, you know, that, like that, that right there can ruin the deal. So finding great people to work with is super important. All right. Thank you for being on the show for the third time, uh, Chris. If people want to connect with you, learn about your projects, maybe invest with you or, or just follow what you're doing, how should they uh, connect with you? Uh, Instagram, probably the best way. My personal account is Chris Flipping DC on Insta Instagram. And my business account is the name of my company, which is Summit Realty Investment Group. Uh, you can find both accounts on Instagram and uh, happy to respond to any direct messages I get. All right. Well, thank you for being on the show, Chris. To all of our listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in. And uh, whether you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, or watching on YouTube, uh, leave us some comments, give us some feedback, and share this episode with other people that you think could benefit from hearing it or seeing it as well. We'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests and improve our shows. So give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you want to see more, click right here. And if you want 100 real estate tips from my best-selling book, click right here to download them instantly. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And leave some comments about what you think on the videos.